بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله We begin in the name of God, the most compassionate, the most merciful and we send peace and blessings on his Prophet Muhammad Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, peace be upon you My name is Asa Tarsin uh, This is the Renovatio podcast affiliated with Zaytuna College Today I'm going to be speaking with Joshua Harris uh, Before we begin I'd like to introduce our guest uh, Joshua is an assistant professor of philosophy at the King's University in Edmonton, California. He's also a PhD candidate at the Institute for Christian Studies in Toronto. Uh, currently, he's doing some interdisciplinary research on the metaphysics of social institutions. That sounds interesting, and I think we'll probably touch upon that today. Um, we're going to be discussing your forthcoming Renovatio article, um, which is on gratitude. And... Um, I'd like to open up with a, a, a question asking you, what, what interested you in this topic? Yeah, sure. And first, uh, let me say thanks for having me on. It's a real pleasure to be able to talk with you guys. Um, yeah, I, I guess when it comes to my own interest in gratitude, I mean, certainly as a philosopher, I'm interested in gratitude. Um, as a, as a, you know, an amateur student of psychology, I'm interested in gratitude. But, you know, let's be honest, as a human being, I'm interested in gratitude because I want to become more grateful. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. You know, uh, I'm, I'm, fa I'm personally quite fascinated, uh, especially with individuals who have experienced profound suffering in their lives um, and are able to nonetheless affirm their life in a spirit of gratitude, whether it's expressed to, to God or to other people or more likely than not both. Uh, and to me, there's a real moral beauty to that. And it's, it's a moral beauty that, that is uh, personally inspiring for me, but also a moral beauty that deserves some analysis. And I, I think some, some great philosophers of the past working in different traditions have certainly been attentive uh, to this, this sort of phenomenon. And yeah, so that, maybe that's where I'd start. Okay. Um, that's, that's great. Um, I guess one question I would have is, um, how, how would you define gratitude? Yeah, so, you know, different philosophers say different things about it, uh, uh, you know, through, certainly throughout the tradition of Western philosophy. But, you know, as a rough and ready definition, I'd say proper, uh, probably something like, um, you know, a proper or owed response uh, that a recipient of a gift or a benefit uh, owes to that benefactor. All right, so you, you, uh, you know, let's just make it a very concrete, you know, you're, uh, um, you receive, a, you're a small child, you receive a gift from your grandmother, uh, maybe you don't particularly like the, you know, the gift that you receive, maybe it's like a sweater or something where you're hoping for a toy, you know, at, children can relate to this. Um, and, uh, you know, we would expect, nevertheless, even if you don't, even if you aren't overjoyed with the gift that you've received, you would at the very least, at least if you're the parent of that child, you would expect the child to say thank you. You would, you would expect the child to express gratitude upon receiving that gift. And why is that? Well, it's not just because of the object given. That's kind of the whole point of gratitude is that it's a, you're, you also have to be attentive to the intentions of the, of the benefactor. Right? And that, that's actually classically what distinguishes something like gratitude from uh, justice, which, you know, gratitude and justice are very similar. They deal with social relations uh, between people and societies. But gratitude, at least classically conceived, and this comes out in, in, in uh, Seneca's uh, work, which is, my, which is what my article is about. It's about Seneca. Um, uh, so what Seneca says is that, well, you know, uh, gratitude has a lot to do with being attentive, not just to the thing that is being received, which mediates the social relationship, but also to the intentions of the benefactor. And when I say benefactor, I mean the one who's giving the gift, or the one who's, who's offering the benefit. Okay. And so, uh, you know, you, you touch upon this in your article, um, which is forthcoming in, in Renovatio, uh, entitled The Human Arts of Graceful Giving and Grateful Receiving. Um, there's, there's this kind of tension, right, between the fact that our gratitude to the benefactor should be spontaneous on the one hand, 
um, yet it's expected and there's, there's a type of comportment around giving gratitude. Can you talk a little bit about how to reconcile that? Yeah, sure. I mean, this is uh, classically what philosophers have, have dealt with throughout uh, various traditions and trying to think about gratitude and trying to analyze it. Um, usually what, at least in Western philosophy, what is usually done is to speak of gratitude as in some sense owed, but it's owed in a different way uh, and it's equalized, the debt is equalized in a different way than, you know, basic standards of, of justice, right? So, you know, someone like Thomas Aquinas, um, uh, we'll talk about a debt of honesty or a debt of friendship as opposed to like a, you know, a debt where, that you have to pay back in some sort of monetary way or a debt that you have to pay, you know, it, it, you know it, in a courtroom or something like this, right? So when, you know, when, and I think I put it this way in the, in the piece is like, look, when, when uh, you know, my friend pays for my lunch one day and um, I should express thanks. I should recognize that, that the gift, the benefit that's being offered. Again, it's the intention of the benefactor that matters here. It's not just the thing. It's not just the food on the plate that is being offered here. It's an extension of, it, of um, one's goodwill. And it's in, the, it's in the, this uniquely, like when we talk about the art, we, we talk about gratitude as an art. I think this is really where the artistic thing comes in, you might say, because you have to have a unique, if you're going to do gratitude right, you have to have a, that unique sensitivity, right, mm -hmm. to the reciprocity uh, that the gift exchange involves, right? So, in fact, someone like Seneca and, and Thomas Aquinas will even say is that most of the time when it comes to gratitude, it's not really even appropriate to, to um, you know, to do something for the, for the other person back right away. Right, mm -hmm. you kind mm. you kind of want to want to want to bask in the gift that you've received, and to express a full appreciation that way, and then to give something back kind of later on, right? So that there is this, you know, and it's not an exact science. You know, that's why I say it's art rather than science. But it it's certainly something that that we all kind of know by experience. And I think what, basically um, when we're talking about Seneca, which is the the article that I was I was writing for Renovatio. Um, really, you, you, gr you have a, a renewed appreciation for the way in which these sorts of gift exchanges actually underlie all the other social relations we have. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so if you don't have these basic you know, relationships of gift exchange, if you have to mediate all of your social relations with something like money or, or some like objective standard of what counts as right return, man, your social order is in trouble, right? So, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah wh whatever it comes, whenever it comes to, um, you know, resolving this sort of paradoxical notion of the way gratitude is in some sense owed and in some sense not owed, um, well, you know, it, it's more about the, the reciprocity than it is about, like, specifying the exact conditions mm -hmm. of right return. Yeah. There's a, there's a hadith, a tradition um, of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, which says something, you know, d directly related to this, where he says, tahadu tahabu, right? That exchange gifts and you'll engender love between one another. Um, so I think that, that, uh, that, that idea of social harmony being developed through gift giving, um, I, I think definitely uh, co corresponds with our teachings. But, but there's, there's something else that I think you touch upon, which, which uh, you know, speaks to the Islamic tradition as well, which... You know, there's another hadith where the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, says, he who does not uh, thank God will not thank people. Um, and so there's this correspondence between being grateful to God um, and being a person of gratitude and then being able to express gratitude to others and, and vice versa. Um, can you talk a little bit about this relationship between gratitude to God as the giver, of, the true giver of gifts, perhaps, and then... Um, our social desire to, to get, have gratitude for the benefits people bestow upon us? Absolutely. Yeah, no, I think it's a fantastic point. Um, well, first of all, let's just say uh, there's a lot of work that's being done right now in empirical studies in psychology that basically bear out that exact point, <laughs> the one that you just made. People yeah. who have consistent expressions of gratitude toward the divine toward God, and you know, they're studying people of all different traditions, right? Um, but 
Absolutely. They, they report higher levels of resilience. Yeah. They report higher levels of, uh, you know, um, the strength of the relationships they have with other people, family members and friendships, this sort of thing. They even report higher levels of, of physical health, which is maybe something wow. that it yeah. doesn't jump off the page. You wouldn't, maybe wouldn't have guessed that. Um, but yeah, th and these studies can be found. I mean, I, I'm thinking of the psychologists, especially um, uh, Robert Emmons and, and Michael McCullough. Uh, so that, maybe that's just the first thing to say. But, but I think a, in, a, in a philosophical sense or a theological sense, I think it makes some good sense as well, right? So one of the things Seneca does, in the, in, and I report this in the article that for Renovatio, is that, well, look, if, if you're worried about, you know, so, so that, and we can imagine this, right? You can imagine, say, like, well, you know, when you're giving someone a gift, you're kind of doing it so that you get like something in return, right? You want to mm. profit off of this or something like that. And you're, you're, you're kind of, it's like a scheming way. If you have like a really low view of human nature, for example, you might think that this is really why people express gat yeah, gratitude. Yeah, the praise and, and or engaging. the, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, you know, obviously you can imagine examples of people behaving viciously in precisely this way. But what, one of the reasons that Seneca thinks that doesn't tell the whole story with respect to gift and gratitude is precisely because of the relationship between God and the world, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's precisely because that God doesn't need the world and nevertheless gifts, you know, um, you know uh, just showers us with blessings if we're attentive to them, right? He says, well, like, yeah, how in yeah. the world could that be the whole story about gratitude if, if this is what God has done? <laughs> you know, yeah, because God yeah. can't profit off of this. It doesn't, make, it doesn't make any sense for God to, like, you know, personally profit off, you know, uh, the gifts that he's, he's given his, his creatures, right? So, so it's, it's very interesting how it functions in Seneca's argument. Um, and it also coincides very profoundly, I think, with, you know, frankly, what may be common sense. I don't know when it comes to the empirical studies. Like, turns out, you know, if, you, if you're grateful in a religious sense, it's actually, um, it, it does have these resounding effects in other facets of your life. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, that, that uh, the centrality of, of gratitude to God will permeate everything a believer does and, and, and sees and experiences in the world. Um, and, you know, one of, one of the things that's really interesting is one of the great mystics of Islam in Junaid, he says that, you know, to really reach a, the state of gratitude, of being a grateful person, it's to really see yourself as undeserving of the bounty that God has given you. Um, so I think that there, there is something of um, entitlement that has, you know, become uh, widespread in our day that leads to this uh, sentiment of ingratitude and, and sort of um, <laughs> lower coping skills, I guess you could say. So, um, hmm. yeah. Uh, you know, one of the things that, that struck me in your article is that, you know, you, 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 you quote Seneca on, on benefits. One of the things he talks about is there's, you know, there's these two things that God has given humanity. On the one hand, he's given us reason, and on the other hand he's given us this fellowship or, or, or sort of the bonding of society. Um, what are the ways in which you know, those two things as gifts from God allow us to become more grateful? Yeah, that's quite an interesting question. Yeah, so the way, yeah. the way when Seneca is talking about fellowship, He's mm -hmm. talking about kind of that social glue that, that holds everything together. And he thinks if you, upon analysis, and the Latin yeah. word is societas, if you're interested in that. Um, but the, the word fellowship or societas is really about uh, identifying that social glue. And then upon analysis, Seneca thinks, what that social glue just happens to be is this fundamental gift exchange. Right. So mm -hmm. and it go, it comes from the bottom up. Right. So th and this is one thing I would actually, I, I, you know, we'll see what they say about this. But this is yeah. one quibble I might have with some of the, the psychological studies is that they're very interested in talking about gratitude as an emotion. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, it's understandable. Right. You, you do have a sort of bottom up feeling, when, especially in it, when you're the recipient of like a spontaneous gift from a friend or from a family member, something you weren't expecting, that, there certainly is an emotional component to that, no question. And, you know, the folks in the tradition, uh, in, in various traditions, have recognized that as well. But there's also a profoundly cognitive element in gratitude, mm -hmm. too. It's not just simply a feeling. It's a correct recognition, 
One, you know, you mentioned the, the, the posture of a humility that a, a believer ought to take. No question. That's a correct recognition. It's not just a feeling. <laughs> you yeah, are, in yeah. fact, the, the recipient of, a, a, of innumerable ble- blessings from God. I mean, certainly yeah. in, my, in my own tradition as a, as a Christian, that's certainly absolutely how, how we see the world. And we yeah. think that we're not just like, you know, feeling that way. We, we think we're correctly recognizing yeah. Uh, the fact that we are, in fact, in this position, and that if we are to proceed ethically, if we are to proceed in a way that's consonant with our nature, well, then you should proceed in a spirit of gratitude, <laughs> right? Yeah. So, yeah. so that, that's kind of a point. I, I don't know. I, I, maybe I didn't answer the question. I apologize. No, for that. no, but perfect. There, there I mean, is an emotional component to it, yeah, but it also yeah. has a cognitive dimension. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Imam al-Ghazali, you know, the great theologian, mystic philosopher, he, he actually... When he talks about gratitude to God, he talks about that there, there are sort of three uh, facets to that. Uh, one, is, one is what you've called cognitive, but he calls it knowledge. You know, that there's a knowledge that you have um, that this gift comes from God and that you are undeserving of it. And, um, and, and then the second, he says, is a hal, which is a, a spiritual state, which, which uh, you know, I, th- I think you're, mm. you kind of uh, maybe called uh, an emotion in one sense. But then he says the third... Um, is action. So true gratitude has knowledge of your um, undeserving uh, nature um, and then that you are filled with a state of gratitude. But the third is that you, you act upon that. And, you know, you, that's either by thinking and showing gratitude with the tongue or, um, more importantly, uh, with the limbs, acting with those bounties in a, way, in, a consonant, in a way that's consonant with what the giver of those gifts has intended. So True gratitude is what would be seen as a, you know, obedience to God and living a righteous life and, and, and living those virtues. Yeah, yeah I, th- I definitely think that's a profound recognition. And it actually makes me think of something. So one of the, one of the reasons that Aristotle is a, is a little suspicious of gratitude as a virtue is because he, he doesn't like the fact that you do have to have that humble recognition, right? You can see very proud philosopher Aristotle, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so um, he, that's why he's a little reticent. In fact, he, he doesn't call it a virtue, whereas later, later writers in, in Western philosophy and, and certainly in the monotheistic traditions tend to do identify it as a virtue. But I think what, what you just mentioned is really important. So when we think about the, the language of virtue, we, we throw that word around a lot, at least in, in renovatio circles, at least. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, the, the word virtue really means power. It means, it means empowering your spirit, right? Virtus means power in, in Latin, right? And so um, I think we, when, when the classical writers are talking about gra- gratitude as a virtue, they're talking about something that is, again, not just a feeling, although it is that, not just a cognitive recognition, although it is that, it's something that emboldens you and ennobles you mm-hmm. to act in kind. You know, so there's a, a sort of surprising figure that I might mention here, Friedrich Nietzsche, who I you know, don't agree on very much, but he, he's actually quite attentive to this. He, he says that's his disposition towards the artist. He says that's the artist's disposition, is that hmm. you experience a beautiful object, not as just something to be appreciated, but as something you want to go out there and create something beautiful, right? You don't want to sit there yeah, and, and admire yeah. it all day. You want to go out, even if it's not, you know, personally as, a, as another creator of art, it's about living a beautiful life. And, you know, I don't agree with Nietzsche on a lot of things. He, he rejects the intellectual component of all this. He thinks it's just a matter of will. I think that's a problem. But I do think he's right to kind of identify that. It's like there is a sense which gratitude is empowering, right? Precisely because you're humble enough to recognize, to truly recognize your position. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, you know, one of the things that uh, you, you've already touched upon, but I think I'd like to flesh out a bit more, is this argument that, you know, gratitude and gift giving and, and thanking one another is just some evolutionary mechanism um, that we've developed. And there, there's no real virtue there. Um, but these are just, you know, there's a utilitarian aspect to it. Um, and al- although I think that component is undeniable, there is a societal benefit. Um, isn't gratitude more than just that? Yeah, no question. I mean, look, and, and we should say first that, you know, even on the, own, on the evolutionary biologist's own terms, there's something mm-hmm. that can be said in this way. So, so one of the things that, that uh, Seneca has, has his finger on is this idea that um, 
it's in gift exchange that we, we have this uniquely human ability uh, to, not, to not just think as like, I, you know, I'm over here, you're over there, what do I have to do in response to you? It's about thinking of us as a we, as a, mm -hmm. as a first person plural. Like when you get to know each other through the, through the medium of, of that, you know, that precious pro, uh, uh, process of gift exchange, um, that's what Seneca, and that's really what societas is. We mentioned societas earlier, fellowship. Yeah. It's that ability to think, uh, think of ourselves as a we, right? Rather than as just, you know, I'm over here, you're over there, right? And I think, frankly, that this is just not, and this has been borne out, I'm thinking of the evolutionary biologist uh, uh, Michael Tomasello, who has identified this, if folks are interested in that, um, is that this is actually is a pretty uniquely human ability. To, to think mm -hmm. of ourselves as we, we can engage in projects together in a strong sense, in a sense that's not just reducible to, you know, my interests. And I, I, so I, in any case, I, I think even if you, even if you grant the, the evolutionary biolog biologist all of that, it still comes out as unique. It's, it's still, gift and gratitude still comes out as unique precisely because of this unique ability that human beings have to think of ourselves as we rather than just I. And look, you know, you can always play this game. You can always play this utilitarian game and, and offer a different style of analysis. But at the end of the day, it comes down, it comes down to, you know, accounting for all of the data. And what I, what I think that, that the utilitarian thing doesn't account for is the moral beauty yeah. <laughs> of, of someone who, who, res, who responds gratefully to the world, especially in light of suffering. Right? So it's not just that I, I see that, you know, someone's response in gratitude to God or gratitude to others in her suffering. It's not just that I see it as a coping mechanism. Probably is that to some extent as well. But I see it as something to imitate, right? Even if it didn't have the instrumental value. I, I have this, this desire to, to see that as, well, I, you know, I see that as noble, I should say. And it, I see it as noble in a way, again, that's an empowering for my own life. I, I want to act that way. Um, and I, I just don't, like the utilitarian style of analysis, I just don't see how it can account for that, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that goes back to what we started the conversation off with, which is, you know, um, this teaching that giving gifts um, and, and mutually exchanging them engenders love. And love hmm. in, a, in, in a social body is very different than simply just exchanging benefits, uh, you, you talked about sort of commerce as a very clear set of terms. Owing commercial debts is, is very yep. different um, than this, this uh, you know, feeling indebted to someone out of love. And, and, the gift, and the giving of the gift typically being out of love. Um, and that's why we teach our children to be grateful. It's that someone thought of you to get you a gift, whether or not you actually like that particular object, right? Um, that, that, that they wanted to gift you something means that you've entered their hearts in a certain way and that, and, that, and that they would like to express that to you. So I think love um, underlying this, this entire conversation is, is a really important aspect to, to bring yeah, out and no not question. just I benefit. Mean, yeah. I'm sorry about that. Uh, no, I, yeah, no question. I mean, this is why in the yeah. piece I, I quoted Christina Rossetti, where it's like, yeah, mm -hmm. we start learning this on day one, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah. Because we, we are recipients of just unbelievable, you know, innumerable gifts of our own mother, you know, yeah. <laughs> before we, before we even talk about other things, right? So it's, it's not a question like that there, you know, frankly, I, you know, I won't name names here, but there are some academics today, some academic philosophers who question whether we should be teaching our children gratitude. And why yeah. is that? Because they're really attuned to the, the, well, the child should feel, feel it, um, his or herself, and it should be spontaneous and, and this sort of thing. And I was just like, guys, like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> look, yeah. it part of part of part of bringing it, and I, I have children. <laughs> Trust me, I try to teach them yeah. to be grateful. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, part of that, part of bringing up a child is to offer them to to consistently instill in them the correct recognition that they mm -hmm. are in fact recipients of gifts. Like to to not to not uh, encourage them to be attentive to that. I think it's a real problem, <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. and uh, I, I think it's a bit, it's one of those things that you can only convince yourself if you're like an academic, you know, like feeling very self-important that you shouldn't teach your kids gratitude. Like, I know yeah, that's yeah. maybe mean to say, but, but you know what I mean, right? Like, come yeah, on. It sounds like, great yes, in theory. You tell yeah, you yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, it sounds good in theory. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think, I think one of the things that it also denies is that, you know, this, this thing that 
all aspects of human nature in its natural state are just good and should be embraced. And there's, there's nothing that we should inculcate in ourselves, right? Um, in our tradition, we, we, we have this concept of sort of, um, you know, embodying something through will over time until it becomes a natural disposition. So some people are just very naturally grateful. Uh, you can see that even with children. You give one child a gift and they're, they're just, they're teeming over with gratitude without any adult um, nudging them to do so. And then you have other children that, that really do need that, you know, <clears throat> yeah, please remember to thank so-and-so for that, right? <laughs> and so, you know, even in that, you can see that some people have that natural disposition. But um, in all of these virtues, there is a component of through practice and through uh, willful embodiment of it that one will develop it over time. So I, I think there's, there's probably, a, 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 on a for, more fundamental level, there's a difference of opinion on, on what human nature is and, and how human character is developed uh, more, than, more than just the, the question of gratitude. Yeah, yeah I, I, no question about it. Yeah. Yep. I mean, to, to be complacent, to, to be to com to be complacent in a way that does not allow us to realize ourselves in the in the ways that the, the virtue tradition tells us we should be realizing ourselves is a I think it's a tremendous tragedy. I, th I think we're falling short of a human potential there. Yeah. If we if we uh, are complacent about that. Yeah. So I, I'm going to um, ask a probably a, a slightly controversial question. Can someone truly be grateful without being grateful to God? Mm. Yeah, I mean, look, I, my, my first inclination is to say yes. I mean, look, the same, in the same way uh, that human beings are in a natural position of hopefully being grateful to their own mothers, uh, in the way that they can be grateful to their own uh, friendships, in the way that they can be uh, grateful to other family members in their lives, there's no mm -hmm. que like to, to me. I, I would be I would be a bit, uh, you know, I would be hesitant to somehow say that that doesn't count, or or that's just ultimately worthless or something like that. Um, but at the end of the day, I, I do think that there is something missing, frankly. And it, it's yeah. not just something missing that's like another, you know, another thing to be grateful for. It's, it's something missing that, that is in some sense the whole thing, right? So the, the, ways in the way in which the whole can be missing uh, and yet have its parts, right? So, the, you know, I, I would be, you know, again, I, I don't want to be, <laughs> be the, the yeah. sort of person who just rejects you know, so someone's natural dispositions because uh, I think they are wrong about certain things, certain fundamental things. Um, but mm -hmm. at the same time, yeah, no question, uh, it is different. And, and again, yeah. I think both for philosophical and theological reasons, but then also for, frankly, empirical reasons. Um, yeah. I think uh, being grateful to God is fundamental uh, in ways that are not well appreciated. Yeah. Ghazali has an interesting uh, uh, way of conveying this, where, where he says that it, you know, that all gratitude is should be truly to God. That you should even see others um, giving you things as just the means through which God is is giving you things, um, and to only focus on thanking uh, the person would be like somebody who has, you know, there's a great king and he gift, he sends one of his ministers to gift you something. And you're just so grateful to the minister, um, but you don't realize that the minister is not the true giver of the gift. Rather, it's the king who has sent the minister. Um, so I think in, in this sense, uh, I, I would agree with you that the gr gratitude to God is the whole um, through which we would sort of understand and experience our gratitude uh, to people. And, and, and that's why I love that tradition that, you know, the one who doesn't thank people doesn't truly thank God. Because they're, they're still inseparable. You can see God as the only giver of gifts, um, but still show gratitude to the, to the means through which those, those gifts um, reach you. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it certainly resonates with Christian tradition as well. I mean, uh, uh, one yeah. of the things that um, Peter Lighthart in his book, Gratitude and Intellectual History, and, you know, in intellectual history, is, he means Western history, but, you know, it's still quite very valuable as a, as a text. One of the things he kind of highlights is that in our in our in Christian tradition, um, we should be attentive to St. Paul's letter to the Philippians, 
Because what, he's, what he does in the address uh, in that text is say, I thank my God, <laughs> you know, for you all, effectively, <laughs> Philippians. Yeah. And it's a very strange thing. So if you, if you were attentive to the, the standard kind of Roman, uh, what, what you would actually find in Seneca, frankly, the R- Roman convention for offering gratitude, that would be very strange. That would be bizarre. It, it might mm. even get you the title of an ingrate. You know, <laughs> early Christians were actually called ingrates because they, they weren't properly uh, grateful according to, to um, you know, the, the, the Romans for, to, the, to the emperor, uh, to the empire. Um, you know, they were talking about this, you know, gratitude to God and, and uh, uh, you know, others as being mediators of that. And uh, yeah, so it is different in the monotheisms, I, I, no question. Yeah. Uh, well, it's interesting, you, you, you segued that for me perfectly. You know, one of the things in our tradition is, is the word for disbelief in Arabic, which is kufr, yeah. um, is the same word for, for ingratitude. So sort of, you know, one can infer from that that the, the essence of our entire relationship with God is, is, uh, is one of gratitude for, for the gifts that, that he gives. And you know, as we've already talked about with, uh, with other, uh, with sort of the created givers of gifts, that that engenders love um, and, and, and gratitude. You know, one of the things that Ghazali says that I, that I find interesting is he says, you know, uh, he said that gratitude is a virtue unlike some of the other virtues that I've discussed up to this point. You know, he talks about, you know, patience and justice and all of these things. That, that is, is an end in and of itself. And, and the proof that he uses for that is, you know, there's a verse in the Quran that talks about the denizens, the denizens of paradise being in a state of just utter gratitude for where they are. But they're no longer patient. They no longer have to be detached from the world. They, you know, all of these spiritual virtues no longer have a place. But gratitude is something that, that we can, uh, we embody um, for all eternity. So, uh, so I think that's, you know, it, it's very central to our understanding of our relationship with God. And I'm sure that that resonates with, with your mm. tradition as well. Yeah, no question. I mean, <laughs> uh, certainly you think of the, the great reformer, John Calvin, described the whole of religious life this way. Um, you know, Thomas Aquinas thinks of, of gratitude as, a, as an integral feature of the virtue of religio. Re- religio is where we get our word religion, right? So uh, what's expected our devotion to God. And again, I, I think Part, part of this comes back to what we were saying earlier about the, the way in which gra- gratitude is not just um, it's not just emotional and it's not just about will, but it's about a correct recognition, right? So in Christian tradition, we talk about the beatific vision, seeing mm-hmm. God face to face. You see the world as it really is. You see, you see God for who he is, right? So uh, in, in a fuller way. And uh, yeah, so you want to talk about denizens of paradise. I, I, I definitely think in, in our tradition, we have a very similar sort of sentiment. Yeah, yeah. Um, what do you think about the state of, you know, you, 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 you kind of touched upon this earlier, but, you know, somebody who's in a state of they're either suffering or um, they are uh, oppressed by someone else. Well, what is, what are sort of, are, are there, uh, you know, uh, and, and, and I'm a little con- worried about using this phrase, are there limits to gratitude, or yeah. are there times in which gratitude can be inhibiting us from other virtues or other duties, um, where there might be an excess? What, what what do we do in those situations? Yeah, it's very interesting. So there are philosophers who have written about this recently, and they they're they're quite worried about situations in which peoples do find themselves as uh, in conditions of oppression. And uh, you think, especially the, there's a great example of this actually in, in uh, Toni Morrison's uh, novel, oh, what, oh, the, oh, The Bluest Eye, sorry, I almost forgot it. The Bluest Eye, where um, this young uh, uh, black girl uh, was gifted this, this kind of lily white, you know, blue-eyed doll, which embodies all the beauty standards of a culture which is designed kind of to denigrate her in, the, in conditions of white supremacy, right? Um, and what this philosopher had remarked on this is like, well, in some sense, like her response of ingratitude almost seems like the correct one, <laughs> right? Because, mm. because this gift, even though it was given with, with, in a well-intentioned way, right, 
actually kind of reinforce the conditions of oppression within which she found herself. Now, again, not to sound like a broken record here, the, the way I would def defend gratitude in these circumstances is again by referencing the cognitive component, right? So if you are, if you are giving someone a gift under conditions of ignorance, conditions of ignorance to such an extent that it actually contributes uh, to the, you know, the, uh, the recipient's oppression, what I would say is that you're actually not, you're failing to give a gift, okay? Yeah. So that there's a failure on the part of the one who's ostensibly trying to give the gift, right? So I would say in this case that the young girl's reticence to express gratitude is actually correct, but it's because it's, it, the fault is on the side of the gift giver. It's not really a process of gift exchange at that point. And to me, I, I think we should be attentive to this um, and, and I think the cognitive element of gift exchange is absolutely, this is why you can't just view it as a feeling, right? If you just view it as a feeling, uh, then you're not able to kind of correctly identify these conditions, all right? Because feelings don't, don't do that. Like they, they do a lot of things, but they don't analyze social conditions for us. Whereas the gift of our intellects, right? That we, that's what intellects are designed to do. <laughs> they have this critical capacity, this sort of thing. And so, yeah, I think, I think it's really, um, really quite an important point. There are things that look like gifts, right? You can imagine this on a social level too, huh, right? <laughs> yeah. With governments and otherwise, <laughs> we have to get into that. But um, uh, when they're contributing to conditions of oppression, right? Well, it's not really a gift. At least that's the way I would, I would probably analyze it. We talk about curses mm. too, right? You can give curses. <laughs> you <know>? Yeah. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. Well, one of the things I, I think that, you know, this is, a, this is obviously a, a difficult question and I think the details definitely matter. But, but one of the things I think that's, that's really interesting is that things all become relative at some point. Um, mm. And there can still be a gratitude, at, le at least in our tradition, even for oppressive conditions, because they can always mm. get worse. Um, and so there's, yeah. you know, there's this, there, there are two terms in the Arabic. One is shakir, which means like a someone who thinks, and then there's shakur, which is, you know, it's the uh, intensely active participle. Um, so it means one who's consistently thankful. Um, and the difference between the two is something that, that, uh, that our, um, our tradition talks a lot about. But, you know, one, one of these breakdowns I think is very useful where, you know, it's the, the one that thinks is the one that thanks for what they, what they receive, what they have. But the shakur, you know, this intensely active participle, is one who thinks even for that which they don't receive, right? What, what, what they're not getting. Um, and so in this is this kind of awareness of God's uh, omniscience of what's best for us and always an awareness that, that the cup is always half full. Um, and, and, and I'm well aware that, you know, these things could be used to sort of, um, you know, quell the masses from, from, from doing anything uh, contrary to... to some powers, desires. But I do think on a spiritual level, it is, it, there is um, a, a great power in seeing that things could actually be worse. And, uh, and I mean, and we see this in, in countries, and this hits close to home for me because I'm, I'm of mm. Libyan descent, um, where you could live under a tyrannical regime um, and really think that you've identified evil and then things can get a lot worse and they'll mm. suddenly become the good old days. Um, and so in that, I think, is just, just this reminder that there's always something to be grateful for. Um, and, and that even in injustice and suffering, we have to keep in mind that it, that it could be worse. You know, you lost one arm, it could have been both, right? You lost one child, God forbid, it could have been all of them. Um, there's, there's always this calculation that, that we can make cognitively that allows us to be more patient and to suffer, I think, a bit more gracefully. Yeah, I mean, no question. I mean, certainly, certainly that's true. I mean, it make, you know, it makes me think of uh, Hamza Yusuf's uh, article in Renovatio, blank on the title, Suffering as Surrender, something like that. Yes, yeah. When he, when he mentions, he mentions, yeah. uh, it was quite a beautiful piece, I have to say. Um, yeah. He mentions the, the African-American wisdom saying, it's all good. And, you know, we, we, you know, might say that all the time. We might, we, we don't really give that a second thought, but it's actually kind of a profound thing if, if you're attentive to what these traditions have to say to us, right? There is a profound sense in which it is all good because it's all Absolutely. coming from the creator, right? It's all coming from God. And in fact, in, in the, the last Latin scholastic uh, tradition, they even have a, a nice little catchphrase for this. They say, you know, 
um, goodness and being are convertible, right? To the extent that something exists, that's also the extent to which it is good, right? So we think mm, of evil mm. as a privation of being yeah. rather than something yeah. all you know out there in the world or something like that, right? Um, and it doesn't mean you're you're you know you're that, that you're just saying like evil is doesn't exist in any sense. That's not what you're saying, of course not. Um, but what you're saying, but what you are saying, is that even in in conditions of suffering, even in in conditions in which there is oppression and there is evil in the world. There is a sense, especially in retrospect, and I think we all kind of recognize that God is making, you know, bringing good out of evil, right? And, and to, yeah. to fail to recognize that would be a failure of gratitude, no question about it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, I think there's something, you know, there's a, there's a tradition we have um, of, of the, the prophet David um, in which he mm-hmm. says to God, you know, God, how, how, is it, how can I thank you um, when my thanking you is itself a bounty that, that you've gifted me. Mm. And God responds, yeah. now you have truly thanked me. You know? And so I think mm. um, that kind of awareness that nothing is really of our own um, and we don't really, we're not entitled to anything um, and that merely existing becomes a uh, reason for gratitude, no matter the conditions, uh, I think sort of shifts... Um, one's perception of the world, even as we work to, to, to improve the conditions of the world. So we would have sort of, you know, a meta-narrative through which we are grateful for everything, even as we work to change particular conditions from, from good to better, right? Um, and, 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 and we would try to, 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 to stop certain harms that we see, uh, because we're definitely called in, in both of our traditions to, to stop evil, to speak up against it, to, to work to change it. Um, and so our gratitude doesn't obviate us of that uh, obligation, um, but nor does it really cause any conflict. We can be grateful about something even as, as we work to change it, knowing that it could, it could go in the opposite direction and get worse. So, I mean, we, we, we can understand that with something like health, right? That if, if we have an illness, we're, we're very grateful that, you know, it's a mild illness. We hope to get better and we're taking medicine for it and, you know, we go to the doctor um, but we, you know, while we're in the waiting room, we can look and say, oh my goodness, look at that guy. I'm so grateful I don't have what he has. He looks like he's really suffering. Um, and so I, I, I think that can be reconciled. Um, but I think sort of in our, in our, uh, in the dominant culture today, that's, that's becoming a harder thing to, to, uh, to reconcile. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. So I think, um, it brings me back to, to the, the notion that gratitude is a virtue of the will as well, right? So mm. a good way to, 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 to know if your gratitude is, is only, uh, you know, self-denigrating, it, it, it's, it's kind of on analogy to humility, right? So, so mm-hmm. yeah, I mean, there probably are some versions that travel under the name of humility that really are just kind of self-denigration. But of course, that's not what we're talking about when we're talking about humility. And I think the, sa- the same, same is the case for gratitude as well. A good test for whether or not you, you've got the real thing is whether it en- ennobles you to go out into the world right, mm-hmm. um, and carry things on in a way that do it, that it is in consonance with, with God's providence, that is a response to, to vocation. Right. I mean, I, th- I believe actually Al Ghazali mentions this as well. Is that is that in that case when the um, when the king, uh, you know, off- offers uh, uh, the man provisions to come visit him, right? Mm-hmm. So and and he gives him an animal and and these other material possessions. Yeah. Like it's yeah. great to like appreciate that and, and and thank him or whatever from a distance, but you should come. Like <laughs> he's given you the provisions to come visit him. Yeah. You got to get up the, and go. The horses. Right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and exactly. that's the idea. That's the yeah. idea of, of exactly the horses. The yeah. virtus is, is again, that ennobling thing is that, is that it, you know, if, if it's only about feeling, if it's only about just kind of complacently appreciating, you haven't quite gotten it yet. Gratitude is about that interested response to go mm-hmm. out and create something beautiful, beautiful yourself. Right. And go out and respond in kind. And we all know this. We, we all know this from from experiences of friendship. We all know this in, in uh, experiences with with family life. Um, but it's good to reflect on it. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, there's a, you know, a, an adage in our tradition that says that, you know, true gratitude is to 
utilize those gifts that God has given you only in ways mm. that are pleasing to Him. So there's, there's something about you know, being grateful for the gift, um, but that the, that the highest form of gratitude, right? Um, because there are obviously levels of gratitude, just as you mentioned, there's a golden mean to, to, to where gratitude lies, um, is, is yeah. really to use it, as Ghazali says, to get on that horse and go to the king. Um, and, mm-hmm. to, and to use them in his service, right? To go and use these provisions he's given you in these, in these, in these riding beasts in his service. Um, so one last question before we wrap up here. What are some practical ways you'd give our listeners to sort of engender gratitude or um, if they sort of feel like they need some, some guidance on how to become more grateful? What would you advise? I, like I, I could use some advice myself. <laughs> the, the first thing, first thing I, w- I would probably suggest that has worked e- even in my own study. I've been studying this kind of seriously for maybe like a year or so because I've been on a research project on it. And one yeah. of the things that, that comes up over and over again is try to find ways to be attentive because it's, it's that recognition of things as gifts which is kind of the first step. Again, it's not the whole story. We just talked about why that's not mm-hmm. the whole story. But disciplines of attentiveness, and I certainly think, I mean, this is what religious traditions are so masterful at. Right? Yeah. In, yeah. In, uh, in traditions of prayer, in, in conditions of fasting, you know, the, these sorts of things, is that it, it gives renewed attentiveness to the gifts that you have in fact been given. Right? So before you can understand, before you can correctly recognize the fact mm-hmm. that they are gifts, you have to be attentive to them, right? And um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> I mean, maybe it's too obvious to say just go pray or something like that, but I, I certainly yeah. think that that's a good start. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I think something else we touched upon is even something like fasting, uh, mm-hmm. privation, right? Even, mm-hmm. even you know, um, self-induced privation, you know, mm-hmm. it's a, it's a, that, that, that's one of the great gifts we get from that. I mean, one of the things we tell children all the time is, you know, there's other kids who don't have um, these, these, these bounties that, that you're experiencing um, to, to basically change their baseline of what's, mm-hmm. of what's, uh, what's to be expected. So um, I, I definitely think, the, you know, the religious traditions have multiple uh, means, cognitive and practical there. So, Well, I, we could do this for much longer, but I really want to thank you for your time, Joshua Harris. Thank you for joining us today on Renovatio's podcast. uh, His upcoming article is The Human Arts of Graceful Giving and Grateful Receiving. I want to thank you for your time and uh, sharing your thoughts with us today. Great having you. Thank you so much, Saad. I really enjoyed it. Pleasure was mine. Mm -hmm.